There are people in the investment industry who hold themselves to a higher standard. They are called CFA charter holders. Demand the best. Demand a CFA charter holder. But it all began in undivided India. When my father, at the age of 12, went into business, that would have been 1917. And uh, he brought his brothers together and they started off a uh, business in spices. Uh, regretfully, the uh, business went bust. But, you know, you have to realize one thing, and it's a learning point. One should always welcome failure, because it is in failure that you learn. You don't learn in its success. So, you see, they learned a lot. And then they started again. And uh, they then started, went into uh, cotton yarns. And uh, my father and his brother had a small shop in, in, in Mumbai. And uh, it's all pre-partition India. And in that shop, they were uh, buying, some, uh, you know, uh, bales of cotton yarn and then opening it up and then selling combs. So one day, uh, a, a customer came and said to my father, my father is a very aggressive person. He's extremely motivated. He was a person who really, really uh, worked extremely hard and was a dynamic entrepreneur. So when the customer came along and said to him that I want to buy a bale of cotton, he, he told him, I said, what is it? What are you crazy? He said, what do you think the shop is? The shop is, we open bales and sell cones. Why would I sell you a bale? So he said, okay. So he went down the road, and apparently he bought his bale, and as he was coming back, father was in the shop, suddenly saw him going apart, and so he hailed him, hey, come here. He said, did you buy your bale? He said, yes. He said, what price? He gave a price. He said, I'll give it to you so much discount on it. I said, fine, I'll take your bail. He suddenly struck my father, I'm wasting my time selling cones. So he went around and he booked up all the finished uh, goods of all the textile mills in that area. And of course, he booked it all up without putting any money down. <laughs> that's the skill. So you see, that's the second that you've got to learn. You better have a self confidence, you have an idea then you have self-confidence, and then you need to go out and test it and expect failure. Because it's in the very process of failing that you learn how to correct and how to, do, how to improve. And very soon we became what was known as the cotton yarn kings of India. And we had to leave all of our businesses behind, and the whole family came over to Pakistan. So that's the background of, of how we were in business. So you could say that maybe our business group started in 1917, the day he started uh, actually doing business. And so if you look at 1972 to now, it's not bad, it's 102 years. When they came to Pakistan, again, we set up um, yarn trading. Pakistan is a new country. 
It needed anything and everything. It had no economic structure, no banking infrastructure, no governmental infrastructure. There was nothing. And all of that had to be set up. And, but there's so much enthusiasm, there's so much passion that the government was actually financed by business people for the first two years of its existence. Every single aspect of the government's requirements were met by business people. And when the, uh, uh, the Korean War came along, the Korean War was the most significant event which allowed Pakistan to establish itself economically. So we quickly expanded and it very quickly became the largest textile mill in the country. And then we integrated, we backward integrated, forward integrated both ways so that we were able to uh, actually deliver not only yarns, but also fabric. And then we wanted to fin finish fabric. So, that's the, uh, the pace of development that took place. As luck would have it, the political situation changed. And the differences started to become significant in terms of India, the India's intrusion in East Pakistan and then West Pakistan and the relationship between East and West Pakistan, which led to the breakup of the country in 1971. That when half of our group disappeared because we had, we were equally uh, established in both wings, about 50-50. So we lost 50%, there was no compensation. We just disappeared. I just forgot to mention that by 1967, we were a group which employed 35,000 people and was already a quarter of a billion dollars at that time. It was about that time that Daewoo started in, in, in Korea with a capital of $10,000 and we were a quarter of a billion already. So when we lost half our group and then we had the People's Party regime here they went through a series of nationalization, which reduced our group even further because we were, our petroleum companies nationalized, our uh, uh, assurance companies nationalized, and so we became really quite, quite reduced. We'd already started our relationship in setting up a fertilizer factory with Hercules Incorporated. And I remember in 1968, I was attending the World Bank signing of the agreements. And uh, after the signing of the agreements, then of course the whole project started. And uh, this came about as a consequence of the fact that the government of Pakistan decided that fertilizer, which was really in the public sector, was now to be given over to the private sector. So we got a $32 million loan from the World Bank at six and a quarter percent at that time, which is a relatively higher rate. And uh, we had Hercules and other cells and we had IFC as our partners also. And so the project was started. My father um, passed away in 2002 in January 2002, and uh, responsibility obviously passed, passed over to me at that time. And uh, what did we have? Well, we had an aging fertilizer project. We had uh, three rundown textile mills, and we had an insurance company that was, a, was the oldest insurance company, but really had no customers. So that's what I inherited as my responsibility. But while my father was alive, I had initiated investment in, in Engo Corporation. So we had 27% of Engo Corporation also. Uh, the history of that is the fact that uh, 
this was a, a, the, a, the ESO plant. ESO had gone into fertilizer manufacture also, and when it from ESO, it became Engro because, you know, there's an employee buyout, the first in Pakistan. So now today, by the case of John, we've gone into, uh, we've been able to grow it, uh, I would say, somewhat uh, surprisingly. Uh, we went from zero power production to becoming uh, an entity as a group producing 16% of Pakistan's total power production, from zero to 16%. We have since uh, reduced that exposure because we had, we had bought a hub core along the way and we've sold hub core also. So Engo then invested in LNG, invested in, in, uh, in the backward integration of the PVC, it invested in, in, in growing uh, its chemical terminal. It invested in a new fertilizer project, very large one. The world, at that time, the world's largest state of the art single train urea process. And we also invested in, um, in power too. So we took five investments all at the same time. And we invested in foods. So, which created Engel Food. So, there's an enormous uh, growth period. And today, and then, as I said, on the way, we also bought Hubco. And as of now, we've sold off Hubco. And we've sold off our food to uh, Free Bank Campina for uh, $450 million, which is uh, a foreign exchange flow for the country. doubling your population in 28.75 years. So if you're 208 million people, you'll be 416 million people in less than 30 years. Now, I computed that. That comes out to something like, you're going to need a school for 570 children every hour of the day, 24 seven. Now, if you look at human beings and understand and, and, and observe, and see how a, a human being, from the point of birth to the last day, what is the most significant thing that the human being, being is do, uh, doing throughout that life? Making decisions. A human being has, in my opinion, fundamentally two parts, what I call the outside and the inside. The outside is something that can change very rapidly whether it's in form of clothes, whether in form of skills, whether in form of knowledge, it just changes very rapidly. The inside changes over decades. It's very slow to change. I would challenge anybody to think about it and say, I want to make a transformative change. It's very difficult because we are creatures of habit. And so the habits tend to drive us. So you've got a, the concept of developing the inside. And that's far more challenging than developing something on the outside. Now, you can read a million books. You'll become very knowledgeable, but you will not have wisdom. Wisdom comes from developing the inside. And it is the, the, the soul the essence of you. And then when you develop it, then you will start to get a greater understanding of what is going on around you. So we therefore realize there are levels of understanding from the very shallow to the very deep. So the idea is how do we expose people to understanding that so that they can have a greater chance of achieving a higher level personal development.
what Maslow called self-actualization. So that is the whole idea of the Kurt School of Business Leadership. So we have a purpose which says that the school endeavors to motivate the development of inspired leaders making decisions based on truth, trust, humility, integrity, tenacity, and competence. So the first five are all those really that refer to the inside. And the sixth, the competency, is what refers to the outside. So in, in KSBL, we are organizing ourselves to be able to provide that exposure to each individual so they can have an exposure on the in, uh, to learn of, the, of themselves, the inside, and also on the outside, depending on what period of life they're in, depending on the challenges they're in. So when you come to KSBL, you're not coming to KSBL uh, to be, as you might say, an alum, alumni in the classical sense. You are coming to KSBL because it's your life partner. Basically, young people today face a daunting world. You know, we are now facing a world where disruptive technology is becoming the order of the day. Everything that we assumed was fixed and reliable is now not the same. Industries are facing ex existential threats because technology could sweep them aside. Education, regretfully, in our country, but all over the world, but particularly in our country, is education for the first industrial revolution. It was for the, 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 the uh, plant, the industrial units of that time, that's 150 years ago. Education has not progressed. Yet, technology is progressing at a phenomenal rate. So the gap is forever widening. So you imagine a young person coming out into the world and sees this. That's fairly daunting. There's not many things that the individual can actually rely on as being stable and, you know, uh, a fixed element. But that's not, a pro that's not the thinking you should have. The thinking you should have should be positive. Say, I'm lucky. I have an opportunity to embrace the new technology and learn to apply it. You see, there's two mindsets you have to have. Either the mindset of resistance or the mindset of acceptance. If you're accepting it, you quickly uh, adopt the changes. If there's, a, if there's a resistance, then you will forever endeavor not to allow that particular circumstance to come about. One, have a long-term view. Two, learn to be consistent. Whatever you decide is your success. Learn to be consistent. In other words, success really comes about when every decision you make succeeds, succeeds in decision you make reinforces the previous one. So you're constantly reinforcing. But remember that when you make decisions, there are no free lunches in the world. There is an accountability. And the accountability is right here. It's to yourself and to your conscience. One thing that, the, that members of the CFA community need to realize is that your qualification has proven to you and to others that you have a certain capability. But you've got to learn to think out of the box. In 
enable yourself over time to think at a higher and higher level. Try to understand that your training, your qualification is your ability to be able to analyze changing circumstances and changing situations. And that is the critical part of life. How do I effectively meet those challenges? For well, they're unpredictable. You don't know when they're going to come. Not in a period of 50 years. But they will come. So you have to develop yourself, your personality, in such a way that you have the strength and the confidence to be able to overcome those challenges and take advantage of them.